Francis, a 25-year-old cop on a night patrol, stopped the hearse driver and ordered him to open the coffin he was transporting. Then he got the shock of his life. It was a bitterly cold January evening. The street was almost completely deserted. A few people in thick winter jackets could be seen scurrying back home for a hot cup of coffee or a hot shower perhaps, but not for Francis. The lone cop was seated in his van, ready to begin his night patrol. Francis was actually supposed to be assisted by his patrol partner that night. However, just before they began their shift, Francis received a call home that the man's pregnant wife had suddenly gone into labor, so he had to go with her. Francis prepared for a boring night. The night began to seem like another peaceful and uneventful night. That was not what Francis wanted. He wanted to partake in some action. Thrilling actions like successfully chasing down a criminal or intercepting a large consignment of drugs and the likes. With such successful operations, he would finally prove himself to his hostile boss, Jonathan. Francis was about to take a sip from his water bottle when he glanced up and noticed the hearse making its way up the road. Francis immediately felt something seemed fishy about the hearse. He dropped a bottle of water at once and sprung into action. With his powerful torch in hand, Francis stood in the middle of the road, signaling the hearse driver to stop and pull over by the roadside. The driver got Francis's message at once, so he slowed down and pulled over. Francis pulled out his pistol from its holster at once, with the gun in his right hand and the torchlight in his left. Francis cautiously made his way to the hearse. Perhaps the driver was smuggling drugs or weapons in the hearse, Francis thought. Francis pointed his gun at the driver, who was still sitting inside the hearse to clearly show him that he was armed, just in case he wanted to do something crazy. The driver immediately raised both hands once he sighted the gun. When Francis got to the driver's seat door, he promptly asked the clearly scared man to step out of the car. The driver did so with his hands still raised up high. Francis, still pointing the gun at the man, quickly frisked him for any weapon. Convinced that the driver was not armed, he returned this gun to its holster. Then he bluntly asked the man what he was conveying with the hearse. Just a corpse, the man answered. But Francis was not convinced with the man's answer, so he ordered the driver to open up the hearse immediately for a quick search. The driver did so at once. Francis made sure that the driver was standing right in front of him. He then quickly flashed his torchlight around the interior of the hearse. The hearse's interior was quite empty, apart from a mid-sized coffin lying in the center of the hearse. Francis then ordered the driver to step into the hearse and open the coffin. The man seemed quite stunned at Francis's order, so he just stood there staring at Francis for a few seconds. The driver opened his mouth to say something, but closed it right back. Francis's instincts signaled to him that the man's delay and obvious shock was confirmation that his initial suspicion about a smuggling operation was on point. Francis was now starting to get really excited about the big break he was about to make. With adrenaline flowing through his veins, Francis quickly brought out his gun once more. Then he gave the stunned-looking driver a firm nod to get right inside the hearse and open up the coffin at once. Realizing that the unsmiling cop really meant business about this whole search thing, the driver had no choice but to obey the order. So he climbed right onto the hearse, hesitated for a few seconds, then he finally opened the coffin. Imagine Francis's utter disappointment when he quickly pointed his torchlight inside the coffin. But instead of the drugs and weapons he was expecting to see, he saw a stone-dead teenage girl. Francis maintained this composure, but deep inside he was seething with disappointment. All these efforts just to see a corpse, he thought. The driver was about to close back the coffin, but Francis thundered at him to wait. The man did so, looking more confused and shocked than before. But Francis's instincts told him that perhaps what he was looking for lay under the corpse. He had not come this far to give up so easily. So he quickly returned his gun back to its holster and jumped right into the hearse. Francis then ordered the driver to help him with lifting the dead girl out of the coffin. The man, seemingly sick and tired of this young officer's overzealousness, didn't hesitate at all this time, as if to tell Francis that he was just wasting both of their precious time with this annoying, fruitless search of his. The man quickly grabbed the dead girl's leg. Francis grabbed her hands and together they both lifted the corpse out of the coffin and gently dropped it on the rugged floor of the hearse. Nothing was hidden under the corpse, not even a pin. Francis even quickly frisked the sides of the whole coffin but felt absolutely nothing. By then, Francis was really looking embarrassed. His instincts had failed him once again as usual, he thought. Francis apologized to the driver for causing him all the inconvenience. The man smiled at Francis, 
telling him that he perfectly understood that he was just doing his job. Francis then stepped outside the hearse and walked away. But suddenly, he decided to take one last look at the corpse as the man was about to close the coffin. So he turned back towards the hearse and flashed his torchlight on the corpse. And what Francis saw sent chills down his spines. Did the dead girl's left hand just move, or are my eyes playing tricks on me? Francis wondered for just a few seconds while transfixed to a spot. He then started running back to the hearse while screaming, Hey you, wait, wait. But it was too late. The driver was too fast for Francis. He somewhat flew back to the driver's seat and zoomed off, even leaving the coffin open. Francis was already about to jump right back into the open hearse when the driver zoomed off at a breakneck speed. The impact of the sudden motion and speed of the hearse sent Francis crashing face down on the turned road. Francis lay on the road, immobilized for a while as he tried to recover from the fall. As he lay there, a flurry of thoughts and questions came rushing through Francis' mind. But the most persistent question he asked himself was, if the dead girl's hand didn't move like he had seen it move, then why did the driver escape the way he did? At long last, Francis managed to stand up. He thought about giving the hearse a chase with the police car, but he quickly dispelled the thought from his mind. The hearse had long disappeared down the road, so chasing after it would be futile, Francis thought. But what was he going to do next? Francis thought for a while. Then he happily remembered that he had memorized the hearse's plate number. Francis had attended countless police training courses since he joined the department. And the instructors had always rammed into the head of the trainees to first and foremost always try their best to memorize a suspicious car plate's number. Besides, Francis had such a sharp memory. The acknowledgement alone that he had memorized the hearse's plate number boosted Francis's morale. At least he had something to work with, Francis thought. He then jumped into the police car and drove to the police station. There he quickly dashed to his boss's office and breathlessly explained everything that had just happened to him. The boss remained silent for what seemed like ages, just staring at the space like he was going over Francis's story in his mind. At long last, Jonathan started speaking. He harshly berated Francis for letting such a big fish suspect slip right from his fingers. Francis was shocked beyond words. He had expected his boss to first and foremost congratulate him for a job well done before any other thing, but the reverse was the case. Jonathan called Francis an incompetent officer. He even went further to tell Francis that the outcome of the incident would have been much more successful if any of his colleagues had handled the situation. To the stunned and disappointed Francis, Jonathan's statement simply implied that the boss regarded him as the most incompetent of his men. Francis was really hurt, but he still managed to maintain his composure and remained silent. But Jonathan was not finished with Francis just yet. He further thundered at him. Now you have to figure out how to clean up the mess you created, and figure it out as soon as possible. With that, Jonathan dismissed Francis from his office. Jonathan had never really liked Francis from day one. Francis was a nephew to the city mayor, Mr. Clark, who always publicly criticized Jonathan for the high rate of crime in the city. As a result of that, Jonathan held a personal vendetta against the mayor. And as the saying goes, the friend of my enemy is my enemy, hence, Jonathan saw Francis as an extension of the mayor. So he had been trying everything within his power to make life hellish for Francis, since he joined the department. Jonathan's goal was to force Francis to willingly resign from the department just to get at the mayor. This was a result of the fact that Jonathan strongly believed that the mayor had used his influence to secure a position in the department for Francis. But Francis had persevered because he simply loved his job. Policing had been his dream career right from childhood. Francis called his colleague later that night. He also added that he had covered up for him when Jonathan asked for the reason he was away. Jack profusely thanked Francis and told him that he would surely repay the favor one way or the other. Buoyed by Jack's words, Francis told him that he really needed his help to solve this puzzling case. Jack immediately agreed to his buddy's request and promised to start working on the case with him once he arrived at the office the following morning. The following morning, Jack met Francis at the station. The two partners greeted each other warmly and then settled down to business. The duo were best friends. In fact, Jack was the only person that Francis really trusted in the entire department. Francis and Jack started brainstorming over the incident, going over all the details piece by piece. Then they both agreed to send out the hearse's plate number to all the patrol teams in the department's database for possible identification and apprehension. 
With the help of advanced technological equipment available to the cops, the duo were able to achieve that feat in quite a short span of time. One month went by, and there hadn't been any good news for Francis and Jack in regards to the identification and apprehension of the hearse. Francis was really getting depressed by the day. He really wanted to solve this case and finally prove himself to his boss. Besides, Jonathan had literally been breathing down his neck every day for lack of progress with the case. Barely three weeks later, Francis and Jack were gradually losing hope for any breakthrough with the case. In fact, with the lack of progress, the case seemed to have grown cold already. So imagine Francis's sheer joy when he received good news about the case on the phone from a colleague one afternoon. The caller informed Francis that a patrol team had found the hearse abandoned in the woods in a neighboring state. Overwhelmed with joy, Francis went in search of Jack at once. He found his buddy enjoying lunch in the staff canteen. Francis happily broke the good news to Jack, who almost choked on his mutton, out of shock and excitement. The following day, the duo were on a flight to the scene, where the hearse was found. Both men wasted no time at all in getting down to business. Once they arrived at the scene, with their gloves on, they thoroughly scrapped the entire hearse. Both the interior and exterior surfaced with an adhesive material to lift and preserve the rich patterns. When they flew back, the fingerprints gotten from the surfaces were sent over to a forensic lab for the necessary tests. Three days later, Jonathan stormed into the office where he found Francis and Jack discussing the case. The two men immediately saluted their boss. Jonathan glared at the duo for a while. Then he shook his head in disgust before suddenly flinging a brown envelope at Francis. That's the fingerprint sample results you have been waiting for, you incompetent fool. Jonathan screamed before he angrily left the office. The two men stared at each other in utter shock for what seemed like ages. Finally, Francis tore open the envelope and extracted the results. Lo and behold, the result conclusively confirmed that it was his very own fingerprints that they had actually extracted from the hearse. It was only then that Francis remembered that the hearse's driver had actually worn gloves that memorable night. Francis didn't pay any attention to the gloves the man wore, as it was a bitterly cold night. His fingerprints were the ones they had extracted from the hearse because he wasn't wearing gloves that night. It was back to square one for the two men, and Francis felt really embarrassed and saddened about his slip-up. Despite the bitter humiliation and embarrassment, Francis was not deterred a bit. He had to crack this case no matter what, Francis vowed to himself. So two days later, Francis returned to the abandoned hearse alone. He didn't even tell Jack about his mission. Francis felt that this was his mess and he was going to clean it up himself without having to bother his body anymore. Francis went inside the hearse and meticulously searched every nook and cranny of the hearse's interior. He had no idea what he was actually looking for, but his instincts encouraged him to continue searching. Just three hours later, when Francis was about to give up on the search, something under the tiniest of holes beside the driver's seat caught his attention. With excited anticipation, Francis dipped his gloved fingers inside the tiny hole. What Francis picked up out of the hole was a cigarette butt. He carefully pocketed the cigarette butt into a special nylon seal he came equipped with. Then Francis promptly left the hearse and flew back to base. Of course, Francis knew what could be extracted from the cigarette butt he had just found. But because of the embarrassment he still felt about the fingerprint issue, he didn't want to get too excited and ahead of himself this time. Anything is possible in this most weird of cases, Francis thought. Though he told Jack about his discovery, they immediately sent the cigarette butt over to the forensic lab for both DNA and fingerprints testing. A week later, the result of both tests were out. The forensic team had extracted both a DNA and fingerprint sample from the cigarette butt. Then they ran the DNA and fingerprints through the police database and it matched the profile of a 42-year-old man named David Miller, who had once been arrested for assault and battery charges. The forensic team then immediately sent the profile of the suspect together with his mugshots to Francis for identification. Francis took one look at the mugshots' pictures and saw the face of the hearse's driver staring back at him. Francis had finally cracked the case. He immediately sprung into action. He went to Jonathan and reported the developments to him. The boss didn't congratulate Francis in any form or manner for a job well done, but he was forced to send over a SWAT team to arrest David Miller. The team left at once. They tracked David to a hotel room where he was taken into custody. David was stunned to see Francis smiling sarcastically at him when he was brought into the interrogation room for questioning. Francis and Jack were the two detectives that interrogated David. After three whole days of an exhausting interrogation, David 
hadn't still admitted or confessed to anything tangible. So Francis and Jake changed tactics. They told him that they already knew that he was just a mere driver for a child trafficking syndicate. The detectives further assured David that they were not really after him, but the big fish of the syndicate. So they were offering him a plea bargain deal. They would help reduce his sentence to less than three years if only he would confess. And that was when David started singing like a bird. He confessed that the modus operandi of the syndicate was to kidnap and drug teenage girls, disguise them as corpses, as they were still unconscious under the effects of the drugs, before getting them over the border to Mexico, and from there to other countries. David also revealed to Francis that the girl he had seen disguised as a corpse had actually moved her hand a bit, as he had thought. According to David's confession, the girl moved her hand because the corrupt doctor that worked for them hadn't drugged her enough. Francis asked David the name, age, and current location of the girl. The girl was named Pamela. She was only 12, and the syndicate had successfully moved her to Thailand. At this, Francis and Jack stared at each other in utter shock. Another SWAT team was sent to the warehouse where David said that the girls were drugged and disguised as corpses. The team stormed a big warehouse located in a quiet, isolated area of the outskirts of the city and arrested five members of the syndicate. The team also rescued 11 teenage girls that were all in various stages of drug intoxication. Meanwhile, the authorities contacted Interpol in Thailand. Then they sent them all the briefs of the case and Pamela's pictures to track and possibly rescue her. The sensational case made national and international headlines. Francis was widely acknowledged and lauded for his sheer determination and dedication to duty. Soon the once virtually unknown Francis became a celebrity cop. He was invited to countless interviews and TV shows. His fan base on social media increased by almost 100 folds in a couple of days. And of course, Francis received a promotion. Even the state governor personally decorated him with a prestigious award. Francis's mayor uncle, parents and relatives were all quite proud of him. As for Jonathan, he fumed with jealousy and frustration as Francis received all the praises he duly deserved. Another three members of the syndicate were later arrested. Soon they were all charged to court and all got life imprisonment sentences. However, David only got a two-year sentence because of the plea bargain deal he had made with the detectives. Barely a month later, the Interpol in Thailand finally tracked down Pamela. She was rescued and returned to the US. Upon receiving the news, Francis's happiness was finally completed. What did you learn from this interesting and inspiring story of determination? Feel free to share your comments with us in the comment section. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.